A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord, princes of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, people of Gomorrah. What care I for the number of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of whole burnt rams, in fat of fatlings, in the blood of calves, lambs, and goats, I find no pleasure. When you come in to visit me, who asks these things of you? Trample my courts no more, bring no more worthless offerings, your incense is loathsome to me. New moon and Sabbath, calling of assemblies, octaves with wickedness, these I cannot bear. Your new moons and festivals I detest. They weigh me down, I tire of the load. When you spread out your hands, I close my eyes to you. Though you pray the more, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood, wash yourselves clean. Put away your misdeeds from before my eyes. Cease doing evil, learn to do good. Make justice your aim, redress the wronged. Hear the orphan's plea, defend the widow. To the upright, I will show the saving power of God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you, for your burnt offerings are before me always. I take from your house no bullock, no goats out of your fold. Why do you recite my statutes and profess my covenant with your mouth, though you hate discipline and cast my words behind you? When you do these things, shall I be deaf to it? Or do you think that I am like yourself? I will correct you by drawing them up before your eyes. He that offers praise as a sacrifice glorifies me. And to him that goes the right way, I will show the salvation of God. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateum. Jesus said to his apostles, Do not think that I have come to bring peace upon the earth. I have come to bring not peace, but the sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's enemies will be those of his household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
And whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever receives a righteous man because he is righteous will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink because he is a disciple Amen, I say to you, he shall surely not lose his reward. When Jesus finished giving these commands to his 12 disciples, he went away from that place to teach and to preach in their towns. Verbum Domini. Living here in the heart of the South, the southern part of the United States, where for the most part it's only 2 to 7 percent Catholic, there is ample opportunity to take note of our Protestant brothers and sisters' churches, many of which will have a marquee sign on their front lawn that quite often throughout the week will have a wonderful saying on it. And over the years, I've taken note of some of these better sayings on the marquee signs of these various uh, Protestant churches, the ones that are theologically correct, these sayings, and I've made a list of them over the years, and I'm up to about 170 now. I might have even have mentioned this in the past. For example, uh, the saying, keep your words sweet because you never know when you might have to eat them later. Or note that when you point a finger, three more are pointing back at you. And one of my favorites, welcome to eternity. Would you care for smoking or non-smoking? <laughs> so some of these sayings are pretty theologically sound. I came across one that I thought was very, very good as well. And it simply said, Christ adds and multiplies, but Satan subtracts and divides. Christ adds and multiplies, but Satan subtracts and divides. And the reason why I like that saying on the Protestant church marquee sign is because indeed in the Greek, the word diaboline, where we get the Latin word diabolus, devil, the Greek diaboline means to tear or rip apart. In other words, to divide. Think of a piece of paper, which is a whole piece of paper, and you, you rip or shred it apart. You thus divide it. That's precisely what the Greek diaboline means. So indeed, diabolus, the devil, Satan, he does divide. He does rip and shred apart. It also means, in a certain nuance, to contort or twist and turn completely upside down in a manner which should be otherwise. And we know that Satan does that. He has a great ability to twist and turn things upside down in a way that they shouldn't be, topsy-turvy, if you will. So I like that saying as well. Christ adds and multiplies, Satan subtracts, and divides until one day in meditation I read this very gospel that we just heard proclaimed do not think that I have come to bring peace upon the earth I have come to bring not peace but the sword 
Jesus tells us in this gospel. Another word in place of the sword, I have not come to bring peace, but division. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's enemies will be those of his own household. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Christ adds and multiplies. Only Satan subtracts and divides. So what in the world is Jesus referring to here? It sounds like he's bringing division. It sounds like he's ripping or shredding things apart, tearing apart the whole. What does this mean? Jesus bluntly declares, do not suppose that my mission on earth is to spread peace. My mission is to spread not peace, but division. Again, words from today's own gospel. Yet we know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, verse 5. And in fact, he is peace itself. Ephesians 2.14. And we know this also from the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 4. Therefore, Jesus' nature is to spread peace. Indeed, he's the Prince of Peace. However, original sin has so badly warped our human nature that in his mercy, Jesus has come to divide, that is, to separate us from all that keeps us from union with him. Look at it this way. Satan divides, rips, or shreds apart as an end for its own sake. Jesus separates and divides only those things and only for those things which keep us from intimate communion with him. Where Satan does it as an end in and of itself to separate, divide, per se, in and of itself. Christ does it only toward those things or only for those things which keep us from communion with him. So again, original sin has so badly warped our human nature that in his mercy, in his loving, infinite mercy, Jesus has come to divide, that is to separate, us from all that opposes his ultimate ministry of peace and thus our communion with him, which in turn brings us peace. That's the difference between Satan separating and dividing and Jesus separating and dividing. Satan does it for its own end, for its own sake. Christ does it so that we may actually enter into a greater communion with him. And he will separate us from those things that will prevent that intimate communion with him. He divides us, for example, or separates us, Jesus does, for example, from attitudes, sins, lifestyles. Attitudes, sins, and lifestyles that oppose his justice and peace. And if necessary, his ministry of division might include, even for a short time, separating himself from our prayers. Let us not forget that the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 15 says, quote, Though you pray the more, I will not listen. Why? Because the people were living knowingly sinful lifestyles and refused to turn away from them. Though you pray the more, I will not listen. Isaiah 1, 15. Jesus may even separate family members for a while. He may deem that this may be necessary. Lasting peace cannot be built on weak foundations. Matthew 7, verses 26 through 27. In other words, Jesus may have to separate us from what is rotten. Maybe one family member is a dealer in drugs, and by his very dealing in drugs, living under the same roof with the other family members who are innocent in this regard, is bringing danger to the home, 
and is bringing danger to these in innocent other family members? What if there's a home invasion one night because the suppliers of the drugs want to be paid and the drug, drug addict living in the house hasn't paid him yet? Jesus may need to see that this drug addict needs to be separated from the innocent family members for a while to bring peace. This is where tough love comes in, huh? In the case of Susanna in the Old Testament, Daniel had to separate two people so that he could arrive at the truth and ultimate peace. Daniel, Daniel 13, 51. Likewise, Jesus sometimes separates people to promote the truth. For example, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 19, where we read, there have to be factions among you in order that also those who are approved among you may become better known. So that the, the ones who are approved, the ones who promote the authentic truth, may become better known. As a parent separates two fighting children, huh? Putting them into separate rooms. Remember that happening when you were a child? As a parent separates two fighting children, putting them into separate rooms so Jesus may need to separate families or family members in order to what? In order to mysteriously bring about his ultimate peace to those same family members. Matthew 10, 34. Again, in today's gospel, huh? For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's enemies will be those in his own household. So as a parent separates two fighting children, putting them into separate rooms, so Jesus may need to separate families or family members for a time in order to mysteriously bring about his peace to those same family members. At the first creation in the book of Genesis, we learn that the Lord separated things. Genesis 1, 4, 7, 14, and 18. His separation now resulted in what, my friends? In a beautiful, ordered world. His separating of these physical elements resulted in a beautiful, ordered, new cosmic world. So do not fear if you've endured the pain of separation for a while. Take it to prayer that what Jesus is simply trying to do is bring about a new creation in you. A new creation in your own life. Read Genesis chapter 1 about all, how all that separation brought about a new beautiful world, a new creation. And the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, tells us the same exact thing is going to happen. A new heavens and a new earth, huh? Our prayer could be, Jesus, Prince of Peace, separate me from anything which might separate me from you in this earthly life or in eternity. We don't want to be separated from Jesus Christ in eternity, my friends. Remember the Protestant church marquee sign, Welcome to Eternity, would you care for smoking or non-smoking? Choose the non-smoking, huh? Heaven for all eternity. Jesus, Prince of Peace, separate me from anything which might separate me from you in this life or in eternity. A real-life praise that was part of this meditation that I've shared with you was this. Although it hurt at the time, Susan broke up and thus separated herself from her boyfriend because the relationship had turned into such a way that she knew it was not pleasing to God. 
She separated herself from her boyfriend because she knew that the relationship had turned into such a way that the relationship was no longer pleasing to God. That's holy separation. That's separation that Jesus desired. Why? Because it was affecting her relationship with her God. This relationship with the boyfriend was. I have come to set a man at odds with his father, a daughter with her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Holy separation. Indeed, Jesus Christ adds and multiplies. Indeed, Satan subtracts and divides. But Satan does it as an end in and of itself. He does it purely to do it, period. Christ may have to separate and divide only to bring about a greater good, the greater good of intimate communion with him. God bless you.